guys, Rob from Georgia here with you, aka VHS 82 apostrophe, with episode 23 of my Italy's Holocaust, looking at Italian cinema horror uh, between 79 and 94, everything within that was so good, the golden era, as they say. Uh, this is the time period, man, right? Uh, I'm, in a, I'm in a video store, I'm on a kid, I'm writing videotapes stacked up like this. I'm going home with things like Suspira in hand and, and Phenomena and, uh, you know, uh, Zombie, uh, City of the Living Dead, whatever I could get my hands on that was Italian, uh, right? And I do remember some fond memories of watching Suspire for the first time. But we're talking the follow-up, man. Uh, 1980, uh, it gets released. Um, it will be shelved by 20th Century Fox. And let me just let me just start there, man. Well, we are talking our gentles inferno, right? Uh, the not so subpar follow-up to his own seminal classic, uh, Suspira, which if you haven't seen it on 4K yet, man, it is. It is out of this world, man. It is absolutely out of this world. Um, the most unique aspect of this film, really in all of the trilogy, is the opening a studio logo of 20th Century Fox. Um, once they realized what a uh, gem they had in Argento in terms of the success of Suspira, they decided to let him bring something new uh, and anytime a studio uh, does that, of course, uh, there's some risk involved. And unfortunately, the risk, ultimately in the end, uh, caused the company to shelve the film for nearly, what, five, six years uh, before it was released only to video. Um, and that is a shame. That is a shame. Uh, you know, I've been, I follow, I use Jim Harper's book as a guide. Um, I, I'm not, you know, 100% perfect. I think I pulled one out that wasn't in here. Uh, I'm not sure why. Uh, and I'm sure there'll be a couple more that for whatever reason he doesn't include. But, uh, you know, he gives a pretty fair assessment, of, a pretty fair review of Inferno. But uh, uh, he also does talk down a little bit to, um, at least uh, in his mind, compared to Suspira, there's even a more lack of coherency in the writing here. I think, you know, the film comes magically a few years after the success of Suspira, which is a great thing, at least internationally. They knew what they had before we got to consume it uh, via video. But Jim Harper, I think, forgets something that uh, Lovecraft had said, which uh, people um, like Fulci, like uh, Argento, I think we're very, very aware of. And that is, uh, let me just uh, hear, um, uh, pulling from uh, Lovecraft and the World of Transition, collected essays on H.P. Lovecraft by S.T. Joshi, uh, the uh, Lovecraft historian. Um, uh, let me just pick it up here. In fact, both his specific comments on individual writers and his general remarks on the aesthetic foundations of weird literature, and you can make application to film here, right? The importance of atmosphere, the cosmic point of view, the superiority of impressions and images over the mere mechanics of plot. Um, this pulls from a Lovecraft essay, uh, which uh, to this author's argument has stood the test of time. Uh, and I think that's why some of us absolutely love um, nightmare logic quality ass type films. Like uh, for me, the greatest trilogy ever is the Gates of Hell trilogy for much of that reason. I loved Phantasm, still do as a kid, for some of those inherently same qualities. As a 14 year old, sat in a movie theater and enjoyed, man, one of the greatest cinematic experiences of my life, watching the original Nightmare on Elm Street. Um, I love that nightmare quality where the line between reality and fantasy or, or nightmare becomes blurred at best. Uh, and you don't even know what's going on sometimes. Um, but you can make reason, you can make sense out of uh, Inferno. It's not that hard, really. It may take some multiple viewings for some. In fact, I'm going to have to say, man, I got the uh, arrow of this. And it is quite the, uh, it is quite the uh, beauty uh, of a release. It's only one of a couple white uh, packaging releases I have. 
but man, you know, uh, Alan Jones, of course, wrote a nice little piece in here in this book, which is really awesome. Um, great poster in here and cards I have yet to open. <laughs> but uh, what I wanted to point, um, and of course, a supplemental disc, which, uh, dude, man, I'm telling you, there is a there is a documentary. I think it's the. Um, forget uh uh Dari Argento and Eye for Horror I think that's a Camel Model production too um but that that is a really fantastic documentary in terms of just an overview right um but there's something I wanted to point you know why does why is Inferno a little subpar to or why does it fall just a little bit short of the mark is it Emerson's um uh what he brings to the score i think there are two more logical reasons uh one that we're all too familiar with as uh fans of the genre uh, and another one maybe we often forget about we we also we we we, uh, we like to invoke or not like but you know what i mean um Fulci's sickness in zombie three and how much that might have affected or impacted uh that film of course i think its greatest detriment was just uh or hurdle to cross was the distance and time between that and its first film. It's always hard to return to that when it's been a while. Um, but in this, uh, in Alan Jones's write up, um, he says something here, and I just want to share this small little thing uh, for you. Um, I'm not going to share the whole paragraph. Um, let me just uh, let me just pick up towards the end here. Um, Alan Jones is just uh, reiterating some of Argento's um, frustrations uh, that we've we've heard all too many uh, times. Uh, let me just pick it up right about here. But our love affair, meaning between him and the studio, that is Fox, was soon over once I had to deal with the studio politic, bureaucracy, and wait for them to make up their minds over casting decisions. Endless memos, short list of acceptable actors, uh, did my head in. It was all downhill from there. In fact, because of a change in regime, just as Argento wrapped principal production, Fox didn't release Inferno in America until six years after it was made and only on video. Um, and so, you know, I think, uh, you know, he was sick. He was uh, really laid up for most of the production. I think what helped save this production was the work of uh, both Lombardo and Mario Baba, who I think this is his last credit. In fact, his last real great stamp on uh, the genre and filmmaking is the insanely incredible underwater photography uh, when uh, Irene Miracle or Rose as her character is and of course her brother Mark played by Leigh McCloskey um, we also have Ilorna uh, Georgie uh, as Sarah um, she's uh, initially in the beginning um, some of these characters will have uh, some really quick demises Mark of course will as the uh, Argento sleuth <laughs> will find his way through the maze ultimately uh, to the very end of all ends and uh, in that conclusion or resolution, which is a bit more positive, I, I say. Of course, Suspiria was positive as well. Veronica Lazier um, as uh, Matter or Matir Tenebron. Of course, she is the one of the three witches, right? Uh, but Ania Pirioroni, I probably butchered. I'm so sorry. She's a music student. She's the one that Mark is absolutely uh, just sort of hypnotized by. Uh, she is uh, considered, at least in terms of this film, um, the witch, the mother in Rome, Mater Lacrimorum. If I said that right. Um, the three mothers. One is in Germany, of course, Freiburg, uh, which we've seen in Suspira. The second one is, of course, Inferno. And the third will ultimately, eventually, we'll see in Mother of Tears. Um, but it is interesting. It's really too bad that Mother of Tears uh, was filmed so late in the game because we might have gotten uh, Ania, if that's how it is, um, maybe to reprise her role and be that third mother. And I really do, well, let me just say those thoughts for something weird, just a thought. Um, Inferno. Um, and so let's, um, yeah, my thoughts rambled, I'm sorry. So being held up, 
Mario Baba, the great underwater photography, of course, by the guy who did the underwater work of uh, Popeye, uh, which is funny. Uh, and he would also be the cinematographer of Demons too, which is man, just awesome stuff, right? And Demons, right? Um, and so the work of Mario and Lombardo uh, being second unit director, uh, probably really saved the production, really, uh, in terms of um, Dario's sickness. Uh, and that, and then the frustration and the in the in the work between him and the studio, which just was nauseating at best for him, I'm sure. Probably ultimately all worked in conjunction together to give us something that I think at this point a little less than Suspiria. Now Suspiria will always be man, absolute tight man. That movie is lights freaking out but i'm gonna tell you man i have watched inferno probably three times in the last week week and a half maybe and every time i grow more immersed i think this is one of those films that multiple viewings really pays off and it's not that i ever was distant from this film or or thought really not well of it i think i just felt personally distant as a matter of how little I watched it but the more I watch it the more I become submerged and the more I can't wait for one sequence one set piece to segue into another and into another and into finally the great finale uh which I think the effect there by the Babas um is quite amazing I think they really brought thank god <laughs> the Dario had he's still on there but what could you imagine what this ultimately would have been had Dario been completely um with all of his wits intact um completely aware and just at the top of his game uh could you imagine just how awesome this final end product and you know I, some criticism has been made of Emerson look he's not goblin uh nobody is in fact Claudio Simonati's work on Three Mothers doesn't even come nowhere close to the work that they performed now, I don't know if anyone has ever can we just go ahead and say Goblin's work on Suspira is perhaps the greatest single score ever put to film a horror film can we just say that let's just get that out of the way Goblin is the benchmark of what it means to put a score to film and there are some great composers out there, man. The work that Carpenter has done, and uh, even just outside of horror, we, we know them. We know their names, man. John Williams and Radon down the line. But the work Goblin did for that film. But I have to say, the more I hear Emerson, uh, Emerson Lake and Palmer, right? Uh, the more I hear his score, it's not as jarring, um, as intrusive as I have heard some say. Um, it really does work for me more and more. And, uh, and the more and more I see certain scenes um, where the character, like I think it's, yeah, I think it's probably Sarah or maybe Rose, uh, she's off in the distance and the camera's kind of back away. And you kind of, and you, there is that. There, there is at times more, I have thought now more than ever, there are some very key uh, Suspira like signature moments. Even though I do think the film. Inferno moves slightly away from Suspira um, in terms of not being as tight uh, written. Now, I love Nightmare Logic. I love it when the line is blurred, but there's something that is something in the execution of that logic that somehow just maybe comes off the screen in an incredible uh, way. And this is a film for sure for sure um that i'm falling in love with more and more and more i wish i could say the same about mother of tears i cannot but that's for another discussion um inferno man um and it's just real quick um some of it like uh the alchemy man just okay so really basically what you have here in the setup i know i waited 14 minutes to get into the setup um and we'll probably end close off of this is um Okay, so Rose is a poetess. She lives in New York. She lives in a building. She comes across a book. She starts to get this idea that perhaps this book, there's more to this book than meets the eye. In fact, she even thinks as much as perhaps she is living in the very building, the house is one of these three mothers. 
And A to her is the book uh, dealer, the antique dealer that is just next to the building she resides in in New York. Uh, eventually she, uh, after her underwater experience, which is one of the most insane things put to film. Uh, in fact, man, just the, the, the portrait of uh, Matir uh, Tenebrom that's down there, the little clues that are laid out, the door that keeps on just slightly ajarring, you're just waiting for someone, even on the 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th view, you're waiting for someone to step through that doorway, man. There's something mysterious. There's something just the tension, man, that is built in that underwater scene is so freaking fantastic. And to have a girl, my wife even mentioned this last night watching it, the, the fact that she could hold her breath as long as she did allows for these long shots underwater. And it is, man, it is out of this world. And so she reaches out to her brother who's a music student in Rome. Um, but unfortunately, the mother in Rome is also clued in already. And so she starts to begin to interfere uh, through her witchery ways, um, which ultimately gets some people killed in Rome. But ultimately, Mark frees himself from that, flies to New York to try to save his sister and understand exactly what is going on here. But by then, unfortunately, Rose has met her demise as well as a few others, I think. And, uh, and then you got this weird subplot too. You got a couple characters that are actually out for their own uh, selfish uh, economic good, I guess. Um, once somebody dies, they're quick to kind of steal their possessions. Uh, so, I mean, it's, you, you have a few things here going on. Um, but once Mark is there and on the trail, then the mother uh, starts to intervene with him. But it's a weird sort of intervention. It's sort of like, well, I don't want to necessarily kill him off, but let him just sort of keep finding his way to me. And then perhaps maybe, I don't know what the end goal is there uh, for that. Uh, but it's an interesting journey. It's one that is very Argento. Of course, this is Argento, right? Uh, very Argento, like in terms of just the clues and, and the, and the uh, stumbling upon this and that and this leading into this and leading into that. Uh, the structure of the building I mean, where, you know, I mean, a more more direct than Suspira, but Suspira, the whole thing pretty much takes place in that academy, right? The home of the, of the, of the witches, right? Um, and the mother. And this, I think the building itself takes a little bit more center stage. Um, and so you kind of follow Mark through and there is a lot of nightmare sequences, uh, decisions that some make, but perhaps only make in a nightmare. And so I, I think there's, you know, way too much to be made out of uh, the incoherency of this film. I think um, this is one of those films where I completely agree with Argento's uh, snapping back at those who have criticized The Mother of Tears. But I'll take that snapping back as for Inferno. This film, this film is just, it's pretty for a follow-up to such a seminal benchmark classic. <sighs> You're, you're never going to re-establish that perfectly. It's here. It's, it's, it's in a film that ultimately becomes the centerpiece of what could have been, and I'll leave that there. Um, a, first release on VHS and 80 by Key, which I think is the first time I've heard of that. Um, of course, Arrow, and uh, I, I'm sure there's other releases. Um, I think I've said all about, I think I want to say on that. Um, it's, um, it, it is, I think, a film that if you've sort of thought, well, there's the Spira and then there's the other two. Hold on to that. You need to go back, dive deeper into this. Um, check it out again. Watch it again. And if, it, if you're like me, you'll find that it will slowly just rub off in, in, in a really kind of interesting way. And the ulterior work is pretty, pretty sick, too. Um, I think there's a lot to a lot to enjoy in Inferno. Maybe not so much in Mother of Tears, but I'm going to get into that a little bit more further, I think, in my next video that I'm about to do. So let me just conclude here with just saying, uh, you know, nothing like doing a series called Italy's Holocaust and then doing a film entitled Inferno because it's awesome, man. The way Italians do film, man, sometimes they really do make you feel like you are in the midst of an inferno. Inferno. Um, I will say the only downside to this film, I think, really for me personally, is the very end of all ends. I, I just doesn't, 
I think there's just a let off a little bit towards the end, a little anticlimactic perhaps. Um, but still, in light of some of the reasons why I've already mentioned, what are you gonna do, man? What are you gonna do? Uh, things, th life intrudes. And when it does, I think we ought to be pretty happy that we got the final product that we actually do. And thank God for Mario Baba and his Im 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 impact on this film and Lombardo as well. As well. Um, so let's just leave it at there. My, uh, oh geez, I don't even know. I know what I'm doing, but I'm trying to think. I know, I remember 25, 24. Eh, I can't remember, but as always, as always, we leave these things off with Go Bills. And be sure to check out my Something Weird Just a Thought. I'm going to continue my rambling on in the Three Mothers trilogy. This is not a dream. Not a dream.